Um, I, I am just going to um, put our agenda up here. We have three presentations with a little break in the middle and um, when we'll have time for a breakout room activity um, at the end. So um, for those of you who need a refresher or for anyone new um, to the CALM uh, meeting, um, this uh, CALM stands for Collaborative Action for Lake Michigan Coastal Resilience. It's a mouthful, so we go with CALM. Um, and it's a network for all of Wisconsin's Lake Michigan coastal communities. And what we're doing um, by kind of meeting on a regular basis is working towards increasing collaboration um, and capacity to address coastal hazards in our, our Wisconsin uh, Lake Michigan coastal communities. Um, and ultimately we want to get to the point where we're developing, revising and adopting ordinances, plans and policies that will make our coastline more resilient. And um, the third kind of objective of this network is um, to regionally prioritize hazards that we can address through collaborative action and partnerships. So um, I think the speakers today are um, gonna be great case studies for, for some of this stuff. Um, I just wanna give a quick, quick update of what we've been up to since our last full network meeting. I think it was in June of 2022. Um, so, the reason we're, uh, we didn't meet in the fall is because we had field trips um, uh, to a couple places along the coastline. Um, we went to Sam Myers Park in Racine and Vermont Park in Mequon. And so um, we're putting together walking tours of these field trips so that if you weren't able to make it, you can still get all of the information and, and see um, the pictures from, from the field trips. So, um, the Sam Myers walking tour is available online and you can um, access it with the link here or you can just go to the Wisconsin Coastal Resilience website and um, you can see all the different stops. We have the information directly from the speakers. So it's a great resource if you weren't able to make it or if you want to share it um, with anybody else, feel free to do that. Um, and then we also have been putting together um, some case studies of different projects in um, our Lake Michigan coastal communities that are working towards um, kind of updating their policies and plans and ordinances. Um, so good examples of how we're doing that in our own communities. These have been added to the um, Wisconsin Coastal Resilience website as well on our case studies page. And we've added four case studies recently, one from Oak Creek, Racine, the city of Green Bay, which we actually have to make an update to because they had some exciting news with that, and um, Village of Mount Pleasant. So I encourage you to take a look at those case studies as well. And then the final update I wanna give about the network is we've been working on a funding inventory for coastal hazards and coastal resilience funding opportunities. And this is in the works, we have our um, funding opportunities collected, but we're working on the technical side of getting them put on the website so that it's easy to access and, and filter through. Um, and so we, Right now, if you visit the page, you'll see it's coming soon. Um, but we also have on the web page some additional funding sources for um, other priority areas that are adjacent to resilience and, and hazards. So things like funding sources that can be used for wetland projects, flooding projects, um, habitat. Um, you can kind of click through and see the list there. Um, if there's anything that you see missing at any point, you know, just let us know. This is something that we can edit and update and make it a, a bit more of a, a living um, inventory if we, as things become available. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to um, turn it over to our first speaker. Um, we are joined by uh, John Edelbeck and he's the director of public works for um, the village of Whitefish Bay. And he's going to be sharing with us how um, the village had restored Clody Beach Park utilizing um, FEMA and Wisconsin Emergency Management Disaster Declaration Funds. Um, so thanks for joining us, John. I'm going to share my screen really quick. Can you see your slides? Yep. Fantastic. So just let me know when to advance and it's all yours. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to share a nice project that we uh, we put together a few years ago. Unfortunately, due to uh, the winter storm that we all experience. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, as uh, Lydia said, I'm John Edelbeck, the Public Works Director at the Village Whitefish Bay. Been here about eight years now. Um, was the Public Works Director and City Engineer in the City of Wapaka for 19 years. And prior to that was in the Chicago area, uh, City Engineer in Geneva, uh, Illinois, and uh, for 10 years and a consultant before that uh, in municipal work. So I've been in the municipal field about almost 40 years now and um, have really enjoyed it and enjoy the variety of work that we get involved with from drinking water, storm water, uh, sanitary, um, parks, roads, facility management, uh, you know, refuse recycling, kind of going on and on. But um, so really enjoy that. And uh, <clears throat> I've, you know, even though we've had a, a difficult uh, erosion project here, it's been really enjoyable to try to bring this uh, area back to something that's a little more usable. So um, we're going to be talking, or I'll be talking about the beach restoration and shoreline stabilization project then um, uh, today. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, many of you probably have been to Clody Beach. Uh, uh, Clody Park Beach is really a, a, a beach that many people throughout the North Shore of Milwaukee come to utilize. And, and uh, uh, the nice part about it is there's nice access to get down to the beach, uh, as well as the bluff overlook for viewing and, and enjoying that view. Um, in the rest of the park, we have some passive recreation. We have a, a, a walking trail. We've got tennis courts. Um, a playground area and that. So it's really a nice park for the whole North Shore of Milwaukee. Um, as you're aware, in 2020, uh, January, we had a winter storm, winds out of the east uh, that caused uh, some havoc uh, and washed away about 20 feet of beach east to west and created a six to eight foot uh, drop off um, on the bluff. Um, obviously, this erosion limited beach access and created kind of a dangerous drop off and we had to fence it off in the interim. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I give uh, I give the county a lot of credit. Uh, Milwaukee County really put forth a collective effort and I don't know the, the people at, at the County Office of Emergency Management very well uh, because this is the first project I've worked with them on but they did a really nice job of reaching out to the Milwaukee County area communities and putting forth uh, uh, and obtaining a disaster declaration, which allowed us then to access FEMA funds. So um, we did apply for um, uh, FEMA uh, uh, grant monies utilizing Smith Group, a, a consultant out of Madison. And uh, the way it was set up, uh, uh, there was a protection grant and then a restoration grant. So there's two grants that we were talking about uh, that we were able to apply for. Um, so the we applied for those and obtained both both of those grants. And uh, Wisconsin Emergency Management actually provided matching grant monies uh, as well, and really became the agency that we worked through to administer the grant project. In all, we, we received over $200,000 in grant money, and um, it actually uh, equated to over 90% a reimbursement for engineering, design, and construction costs. So uh, a, a substantial uh, effort and a, a substantial uh, um, opportunity for the community. So we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so the, the project design, this is just the cover sheet, um, and we can move on to the next next uh, slide then. Okay, um, yeah, this just shows, I, I don't wanna take too many too much time on this, but you can see the, the pedestrian axis, the parking lot, pedestrian axis, walking down to the beach, and then the, uh, the working area. Um, we have a, what I'll call a north and a south section of our beach. The north section 
is uh, is difficult because uh, to work with because to provide the access that slope uh, has to accommodate the pedestrian access. The southerly beach is a much flatter beach, and Mother Nature likes that slope much better than what we have on the north. Uh, you can go on to the next uh, slide. Um, here, it's a little difficult to see, but uh, this entails both the protection grant and the restoration grant. So as far as FEMA goes, these grants are separate and they have to be accounted for separately. Although we had one project and we bid out one project, we separated out uh, them into two different projects. The restoration grant, obviously, as it sounds, would allow us to bring back what was there before the uh, uh, the uh, storm. So uh, a sand or a gravel, it's a, a, a gravelly sand that we have on the beach there. We're able to restore those quantities uh, with that grant. And then the protection grant, uh, we were able to put large, I'll call them a boulder, a cobblestone boulder size uh, uh, stones underneath there to try to protect that slope. And um, uh, so the, the large stones went in first and then the sand back over that. So uh, that's really kind of uh, critical to understand the, the separation of that. And, and even in setting up the grant and how we had a part A and a part B in construction, how that helped. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, so the project was publicly bid and we awarded it to Payne and Dolan. Uh, construction access road was built down the bluff so they could get access to it. Uh, they didn't want to damage the concrete sidewalk walkway. Uh, the large boulders that we were talking about were towed into the slope at the water line. And that was for long-term protection of that, that uh, bluff. And then beach stand was installed on top of the boulders to provide the restoration. Okay, next slide. Uh, so we've got some before and after pictures. You can see uh, this is looking uh, kind of to the Northwest. Um, and you can see the erosion of how uh, Mother Nature is trying to reestablish the, the slope that it wants to establish. And you can see the slope that we have to provide access up the bluff. You can move on to the next one then. Now here again, uh, that's about six, eight feet of drop off. And we do have some groins that go out and some storm sewer pipe and those were exposed obviously with, with the storm. Okay, you can move on. N really another nice picture. Um, as far as protection, uh, we have some riprap that's in the water that you can see exposed there. And uh, unfortunately, they, they only provide protection for the groins. So the water does become, comes in, can come in, those waves can come in between those. And um, if we were to try to put some type of revetment or some type of, of protection, breakwater, uh, along the entire beach, then we would start to deal with the lack of flow, uh, movement of water, and bacterial counts becoming increased. So it's there's competing interests, and, and it, it can be difficult to manage a beach and keep uh, bacteria levels uh, down at the same time. And you know those things kind of work against each other. Okay, next slide. And again, that just shows, you know, kind of that erosion, what we're seeing there. Okay, we can move on. Okay, so this is up on top of the, the uh, park here. Uh, a number of benches, really pretty area being elevated. And they're starting to construct a construction road uh, to get down there. You can move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, you can see the staging in the parking lot. And you can see the size of the rocks that are needed to uh, uh, to uh, provide the protection through the protection grant. Uh, these have to be pretty good sized rocks so that they're not gonna move uh, over time with any uh, action, wave action. Okay, we move on. Uh, there you can see the, the, the beach line, the, uh, the riprap protection, um, and then they're actually trying to placing those rocks 
uh, to the right there as uh, to and towing them in to protect the uh, for future protection. Okay, you can move on. Uh, now they're placing the sand. So this is the restoration portion of the grant. Uh, again, placing that sandy, gravelly sandy material um, and uh, putting that over the boulders. To the north of that revetment is all private beach, private property. Okay, you can move to the next item. And, and there it is. So um, what I will say is um, this is an artificial slope. It's a slope that Mother Nature does not like. Um, we are really kind of constantly fighting that slope. We have to bring sand in periodically. Um, and, you know, other options here, short of what we just did, um, would be to put a, a retaining wall in where that, where that uh, cutoff was, where the erosion was. Uh, you know, almost like a, a flush retaining wall, uh, 10 feet high uh, footings, and then provide ADA access to the beach below that. So, I mean, that might be for another day, a future day, but it's, it's kind of really not, uh, you know, in the cards right now. So we were able to get this back after that storm in, in a relatively short period of time. And again, if you go down there now, you will see some of the erosion that's taken place on this unnatural slope. Fortunately, the lake levels receding have helped with that. So you can go on to the next item. It's just another view uh, in that area. You can see how kind of gravelly that sand is. Okay, you can move on. There again, you can see there is a storm sewer pipe exposed, but you, the gravel's filled back in. Okay, next uh, item. Okay, and then restoration of the turf. You can see where the, the access road came in. And um, uh, what we're seeing actually now is uh, we're seeing erosion uh, in that upland area from stormwater coming down the hill. So we are applying and proposing a project right now, applying for grant monies to do some bioswales um, and other, other means of stormwater green infrastructure. And then on top of that, looking at restoration with native plantings uh, as well to enhance that. So uh, we've got stormwater coming down the hill that is creating rutting as well. So we're really trying to do a couple things here, but we had to start with work at the beach. Okay, the next uh, slide. Um, yeah, so there you can see the restored area, the, the walkway coming down, uh, the beach that's right in front of us, that is the flatter beach, and then uh, the beach to the right, to the north, is the beach that we restored. Okay, you can move on. So lessons learned. Uh, the FEMA grant process requires really a lot of staff time and consultant time and effort. Um, you know, you go through a lot of hoops and questions and issues and, and requests in the process. Ob obviously, it's worth the time and effort, but you have to really put, uh, assign a point person on your staff to uh, administer this and just be patient. And uh, I will say the WEM staff were very helpful through the process. If we had questions, we would just set up a time to to talk to them, uh, 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 you know, telephone conversation, and they would work us uh, help us through it. Um, you really need to communicate well with your public throughout the project. It's a very popular location. Uh, it's not you can't always time this to when you want to. Some of these projects do have to take place in the summer. We were able to schedule this project to start in September, which did help quite a bit. But communicating with the public is really paramount. And then, to be honest with you, we had a hard time keeping the general public out of the fenced-in area um, during off hours, even during construction, even during, well, there's trucks and everything there. It was very difficult um, to keep the general public out of that area. And safety, obviously, is something we're always concerned with. And with this heavy equipment on these slopes, it's it's a dangerous situation. So. Uh, next slide. Uh, I guess that's it. And 
if you have any questions, I can answer those at this time. Yes, we have a few minutes for questions. So feel free to throw them in the chat, raise your hand, um, and we'll get those questions to John. To get us started, I do have one question. I'm what what type of documentation did you need to um, have prepared for um, FEMA and WEM to go through this process? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good question. We <laughs> we didn't have enough. Let's put it that. I mean, you you they always ask for more. They uh, what I would say was really critical for us um, early on was taking a lot of pictures when it was uh, in the before state. Uh, after the event, um, taking measurements, taking pictures with slide rules and tapes, measuring tapes, um, uh, just to, just document as much as possible. Because even with that, they're still going to have you go back out and remeasure and recalculate things. Um, and then, you know, once once you have that, you apply and you're, uh, uh, an emergency is declared. Um, then you just have to be responsive to what they ask you to do. And um, working with the Smith Group was very helpful because <clears throat> they've been involved in these types of projects in the past. And they really were able to, we could deflect a lot of the uh, concerns or questions or issues that came up with WEM or um, FEMA to them, and they could handle that. The on-site stuff, we had still had to go back out and obtain that, that data for them. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions for John? We have one in the chat from Aaron, and he is asking, how long did the full grant application process take? Well, um, we are still doing paperwork. <laughs> we still haven't received <laughs> reimbursement. I got an email today, um, although I think it's months away now uh, or a month away. So. Uh, a long time. So you you will have to fund this. It is a reimbursement grant. You will have to be able to fund that and carry that, those costs for a period of time, you know, on your annual budgeting. Um, yeah, so it'll be, you know, 21 to 23, two or three years. Um, you know, we were able to do the work in 21 and and it went very well and all of that. And it's still been you know, two and a half, it'll be almost three years. So yeah, it takes, it takes some time, but um, you just say, you, you have to be able to fund it up front. Thank you. Hey, John, it's Scott Kanke. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Hey, I'm curious, um, permitting wise, did that, was there a lot of hurdles? Was it pretty simple to get through the process? What, what can you say about any of the permitting process as far as things to avoid, things to include, et cetera, et cetera? Um, well, we had Smith Group handle most of that for us. Yep. Um, I don't think there were, I, you know, I don't know the, the exact permitting that was required, but I think a lot of it was covered under a general permit because of the work that we were doing. Um, this type of work, the, the the size of the work and that we we didn't have to go in and get special Army Corps permits or special DNR permits. They were covered. They must have been covered under, I believe, general permitting. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good to hear from good you. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other questions? I'll just say if anybody has any questions or concerns, you know, uh, you just uh, look me up on Whitefish Village, Whitefish Bay, I'll be responsive to any questions that you have. Well, thank you so much, John. We appreciate you presenting and um, sharing, sharing that with us. Um, thank you. Yeah, so up next, we are going to hear from um, Susan Coyle from the Madison, or not the Madison, excuse me, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage Districts, so those double M. I need a, I need a coast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you need a coast. Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. And she's going to be presenting about a um, lake level study that they did that um, 
looked at how Lake Michigan lake levels could impact their district assets and infrastructure um, and what the district can do to kind of adapt to future lake conditions. So thanks for joining us, Susan, and feel free to share your screen. Well, while I'm introducing myself, yeah. I need you to give me sharing rights again because oh. I had to I had to drop off because for some reason my volume went off. So oh, fun stuff. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, it was like great. This is excellent. Oh, okay. you should have your sheet uh, screen sharing back. Okay. All right. All right. Great. We can see your slides. Excellent. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Susan Coyle, um, and I'm a senior project manager at the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, uh, like Lydia said. Um, I am a civil engineer by training, I'm a hydraulic modeler. I mostly do floodplain. My, most of my background is in floodplain modeling, both for um, consultants and now um, for the district. Uh, but I also do um, climate resilience projects and other things like that. Um, so I am um, going to talk to you about a project that uh, was instigated by the January 2020 storm. So that was a very important storm, obviously. Um, and it, this, it's called Impact of Lake Michigan Water Levels on District Assets because we um, looked at all types of assets. And we'll kind of go through that in a, in a little bit. Um, and I also should say I'm a proud uh, resident of Whitefish Bay, and I'm happy that John is our public works director. Woohoo! That makes you my boss. <laughs> yeah, I am. Your, I'm your boss, and you're my boss. So it gets kind of weird that way, isn't it? <laughs> um, so the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, our mission is to protect public health and the environment through world-class, cost-effective water resource management, leadership, and partnership. We envision a healthier, cleaner, and resilient region. Um, we seek to protect Milwaukee's rivers, the Milwaukee River, the Menominee River, and the KK River. Um, and we do work, all of our work is to protect the, the water that eventually ends up in our lake and becomes our drinking water. Um, what do we do? We um, do two things, water reclamation and flood management. And our flood management is directly related to our water reclamation. We, we are trying to prevent water from getting into the sanitary sewers and ending up at our wastewater treatment facilities. Since 1994, which is when the um, when the tunnel went online, or as we call it, the inline storage system, we have captured and cleaned 98.5% of the water that's been sent to us. Our ability to capture and treat wastewater is being tested by climate change. So this project's purpose was is to protect district assets from the adverse effects of high and low lake levels and river levels and become more resilient to climate change. And this fits within our 2035 vision, which is two main tax. We go for integrated watershed management and also for climate change mitigation and adaptation. And these are very large um, things. They include um, having less CSOs or having no CSOs, having um, structures come out of the floodplain, uh, energy use and everything like that. Uh, as I said, this is specifically came, this project came about because of the flooding in January 2020 at Jones Island Water Reclamation Facility. Uh, that storm, as John stated, the the water um, we had high water levels in the lake, and then we also had winds that were coming from the east, and it drove waves up into um, Jones Island. Um, we have a flood wall, but it didn't come over our flood wall. It actually came in from the south, which I'll show you in a, in a later slide. Um, but this project um, is more of a like look at everything we could potentially go wrong. We had an, another project that was a construction project that looked at the things that actually went wrong during January 2020, areas where we had water going into electrical chases that are underground, 
um, doorways that were um, compromised because of the high water levels. All of those things were addressed uh, right away. And then this project was to take it to the next level and to plan for even greater water levels and greater wave action. So at Jones Island, the high lake levels um, are overland flow, like we just saw in the last picture, um, infiltration into our systems, and then um, effluent pumps not being able to pump out into the lake because the lake level is so high. Low lake levels can also give us problems and were an issue back in 2012 and 2013. We had a report that came back, um, came out in 2014, that was the vulnerability analysis, and it really, focused on low lake levels. And that was because Jones Island is on wooden piles. And as the lake level goes down, we can have deterioration of those piles. And we also have exposed intakes and we use those for fire protection um, and other processes at the plant. We also um, have new FEMA um, coastal maps that show some flooding. Um, you know, we're, we have floodplain property as part of this, um, according to the new um, maps. And this is mainly due because of wave run up. Uh, our elevations at our property are much higher than at other places along the coastline because we have a flood wall. And that flood wall drives up those that, that wave action and gives us higher elevations. Um, farther downstream, you know, farther south and farther north where we have beach properties like in Whitefish Bay, that wave action is, is dissipated by the, by the beaches. Although if your beach is sloped like the one in Whitefish Bay, you're gonna have more wave run up than if it's the way that it wants to be like John talked about. At South Shore Water Reclamation Facility, which is located in Oak Creek, um, we have, it's actually a kind of two-tiered, it's very similar to Clody in the fact that there's a lower area and then there's an upper area. And the upper area obviously has no problems when the lake levels are high, but this lower area, which this is a picture of that area, um, we have uh, basements in some of our buildings and sump pumps are constantly going um, and it's critical to keep these basements dry. We also have um, problems with our storm sewers, surcharging, sand buildup in the storm sewers, um, outfalls covered by lake sediments, and they're just an unknown condition. So these are all things that we wanted to evaluate as part of this project. In addition, we had some we have some issues at our headquarters building. We have a dock. This is our dock. It has four slips. This most southern slip is for the Pelagos. The Pelagos is a research vessel um, that is manned by a crew of, I think, five. They are all master's level scientists who go out and sample um, throughout the area. And this this sampling has been going on for 40 years. Um, but as the lake, it's a fixed dock, and as the lake level goes up and down, it makes it very difficult for them to um, put their equipment onto the boat and to get it off. And it, it's becoming it was becoming very dangerous when we had these low and high lake levels. Um, so we this was a pretty easy fix. We're actually going to be putting in and in a um, floating type of dock on this, just on this piece this area and all the rest of them will stay um, fixed because the other two boats that we own um, do not need that to be a little more flexible. Uh, we also looked at the conveyance system. We had a different con uh, consultant do this part of it and they're still working on it, but we have um, lots of uh, combined sewer overflows around um, on, our, on our rivers. And as the water levels get higher, we have water coming in from the river or the lake, and we also are not able to discharge out of there. And so we're evaluating what can we do when the water levels are high? How can we overcome that? The analysis parameters um, that we looked at, uh, this, this took quite a while to decide what we were going to uh, to fix on. Uh, we thought this was gonna be a very easy, we just look at a report and, and we can figure it out. Um, but it's not, it wasn't as straightforward as we thought. Uh, we ended up going with, for the average lake level, um, a statistical monthly average of Lake Michigan gauge data 
um, for the last 50 years. And then for the high lake level, we ended up going with a 500 year flood elevation from the 1988 report. Um, and so that was, it sounds like it's so long ago, but that actually shows a higher water surface elevation um, than some of the more recent studies. Uh, the team's research determined that current expectation among lake level experts is that for the foreseeable future, the lake levels will likely continue to vary within a small, a similar range as it has been uh, observed in the historical record. This range of about eight feet has been fairly consistent within the past 4,000 years. So it's kind of crazy to think about. But we still, the fluctuations sometimes happen a lot quicker now because of the way the storm events happen. We also had to look at river water elevations because we do have CSOs on the rivers. And so we looked at HECRAS models. So those are hydraulic models of the rivers and from our recent water course projects. And for the average levels, we used mean daily flow. And for the high, we used the 500 year flows. River and lake impacted outfalls, so that we have areas where it, sometimes it's impacted by the river and sometimes it's impacted by the lake. They would use the greater elevation for the analysis. And then we needed design storms to use for conveyance, the conveyance modeling. Um, and these events, these are interesting because people look at these and they say, well, you don't have the same system in place. We are actually just using the precipitation, the, the storm event itself. We consider the June 2nd, 1954 event to be about a three-year event, and we apply it to the current system. So with the tunnel in place, with our current operating strategy and so on. And then we have the 10-year event of the July 17th, 1959. Um, we also used a verification storm for the advanced modeling, one where most of our current facilities were in place. And so we could verify if it was showing um, combined sewer overflows in the appropriate places and so on. The study findings um, at Jones Island, we looked at the current flood wall, we looked at uh, these elevations, we chose, you know, we had certain ele elevations we were looking at. We looked at the theme of coastal flood map and so on. And this is the way this, when the storm wave goes in like this, it actually, go, at the very bottom of the picture, you can kind of see how there's slips. And those are on the port, um, the port's uh, property, not our property. And what happens is the water actually goes down those slips and then comes in our front door. So it kind of actually comes from the south down the road and then kind of comes into the, the facility. And so to, to, to mitigate for that flooding would be a much more um, larger scale type of project because it wouldn't just be on our property, it would be also um, at the port property. Uh, the biggest problem with that flooding in January of 2020 was the fact that there were people on Jones Island working. The storm happened, they couldn't go home and the people that were supposed to relieve them couldn't get there. So we have a solution because we have essentially, you know, those duck boats in the Dells, we have those, a, a boat like that and an amphibious vehicle, I guess you could call it. And we uh, have that because we use it to inspect the tunnel. And we're planning on putting it at Jones Island um, in case an event like that happens again so that people can get on and off the island. Here's a great picture of that flooding um, and just how inaccessible it was um, to get on and off the, as we call it, the island. Now it's more of a peninsula, but we still call it the island. And so this shows you the darker colors on the right-hand side kind of show you the lower areas and the areas where water um, accumulated and other things like that. Um, and we, as I said, it would be a much more extensive project in order to essentially flood proof that. So finding out other options was a better idea in this case. So no additional projects on top of what was already done um, for that other pro for the other construction project um, were recommended at this time. At South Shore, um, we have the, this is the lower area of South Shore. You can kind of see how it starts to slope up on that left side it's with the red contours. They start to go up the hill. Um, but this is what our flood wall um, and everything looks like there and the wave action at that location. 
um, we studied that and how what was happening. We know that the wave action does get over the flood wall and it comes through the flood wall as that picture earlier in my presentation showed. And so we wanted to mitigate for that action. Now behind the flood wall, we have a, um, and this is not a true flood wall in the, in the extent, um, at Jones Island, it's an actual concrete flood wall built as a flood wall. I don't think it's actually like um, permitted as such, but it's more of a flood wall. This is a, this is a sheet pile wall, but it you know, protects us to some extent. But you'll notice behind the wall, it's asphalt. And then there's a service drive. And what happens is the wave action gets goes over that wall and it hits that asphalt and then it keeps running off. And in the, in the wintertime, the service drive ices up really badly. Um, and so we, and then in the summertime, it, fill, it fills our, um, our storm system with sandy water. So I, we are proposing that we put in a bioswale behind there to soften what happens. So you can kind of see what the cross section would look like. And so the water would, if the water gets over the wall or through the wall, it would go into this more of this bioswale and it would dissipate the power of that water coming over. Um, so that is one of the things that had, was recommended for South Shore. The other thing was to clean out the current storm sewers as much as possible and to put um, some kind of check valve um, or ductile valve or something like that on the ends. The conveyance system modeling is still in full action. We are finding some really interesting things. We have a lot of ways to divert flow within our system. It's a very complicated system and it includes, you know, the, the combined sewer areas in Milwaukee and Shorewood, which also have all kinds of crazy passive type of diversions and things like that. Um, so it's it's becoming a really exciting project where we're seeing some um, things that ways that we can really maximize the storage within our system, not only in the deep tunnel, but also in the actual system itself. And, you know, letting water into the tunnel from places that are in jeopardy of overflowing, overflowing or also um, having basement backups. So we look at, you know, the way that it looks on a, on a profile, areas where we're surcharging and other things like that. And we are like I said, we're currently working on the alternatives for this particular area. Um, we kind of use the word flow shifting, but we essentially are moving water from part, you know, certain parts of the system or other parts of the system. Um, we're talking about opening gates only slightly to allow water into the into the tunnel, what to kind of shave peaks off of our um, off of our system, off of the water in the system to prevent overflows or back up into basements. Um, so we're really excited about what this might mean for our operations and how it may um, protect our customers. And I think I saw somebody had a question and I'm at my question slide, so. Perfect. Oh. I just gave you a, a warning on time and you, oh. you just ended just as I sent it. So that worked out perfectly. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Susan. We have a couple minutes for questions still. So again, feel free to um, unmute yourself, raise your hand, or, or throw your questions in the chat if you have any. Hey, Susan, this is Aaron Owens from Surpec. I'm wondering if this if, if there has been any flooding previous to this event on Jones, Jones Island, or is this the first time? I believe there, there was, but um, uh, the majority of the people that work here now were, you know, don't remember anything in particular, but my assumption is we would have flooded in like 1986. There was a really bad storm um, that flooded lots of places, um, but I don't know specifically, but I can find that out. I'm sure somebody knows. So I will email you. Oh, thank you. Cool. Because I'm curious myself too. Susan, this is Andrew Strzok. Um, 
Hi. Uh, really interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. I was curious, in looking at Jones Island, it looked like part of the treatment facility is actually in the um, in front of the flood wall, um, but behind the bulkhead. Is that is that the case? What what exists there? Um, looks like it is actually yeah. So the way so I'm in still in conversations with FEMA about that floodplain. So it kind of looks like you know, I can reshare just to I can pull that up so that you can. Let's see. I think you're talking about. Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. So yep. how this is this back here over here. So this this piece. Yeah, yeah. so this is just because of elevation. So the flood wall is actually right here. Oh, okay. It's right on the edge and then it comes around like this. Okay. This and then the elevations of all this land is actually much higher, but our our elevation is 591 because of the wave action and the flood wall and what it what it causes. And so these elevations are lower than well, some of them are lower than 591. This is a very gross, you know, like a very um it's not specific like they didn't use contours or anything like that to draw it they just said oh it's about that and so i'm still having conversation i'm still trying to figure that out i'm sussing through you know i'm kind of i asked some questions of FEMA, and they just got back to me in the last week or so um so yeah that is that's kind of an interesting thing like does what does that mean exactly um uh because we have a we have a flood wall. Do we have to get it permitted now? I mean, because these are brand new maps. We didn't have any yep. any um, coastal maps before this. So we're just, we're trying to figure out what does that mean. That that's our tertiary treatment. So um, oh, okay, yeah. And then one other quick follow up question, if I can. Um, sure. Seven seven ninety four obviously looks like it's it's out of the floodplain, is there any consideration like an emergency access from Jones Island to 794 for you guys or? Oh, interesting. Uh, no, not that I know of. Um, and the water wasn't super deep. You know, it's not like that was a, that, that was, I don't think they thought about it when, you know, what it doesn't get thought about when they're making the coastal maps that the water the mechanism by which the water gets in there. So it's mm -hmm. really coming in through this flip and then coming, you know, under the 794 bridge through our front door and like essentially getting in that way. And yeah. so we aren't worried. We actually aren't worried that this is what's going to happen. So what's on this map, if we're not thinking, oh yeah, that's, it's going to overtop our wall there. No, now we know that our vulnerability is actually through this, this lower, the Southern part of the plant and through that way. Right. I was just curious if they would, you know, give you that immediate connection up to 794 elevation in order yeah. to get out as an emergency. I mean, obviously they don't want it regularly used. Probably, but, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know. No, I mean, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Well, thank you. This is very cool. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Susan. So we have one question in the chat um, about if there's been any consideration in placing um, revetment in front of the existing bulkhead and around the pipes to avo uh, absorb wave energy and um, reduce the wave run up. And um, yeah. if you could just take a minute to answer that. because we're, we're Sure. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's great that um, you asked that question because when I put the RFP out, um, I essentially said I wanted that looked into. Um, and as far as the the level of what we wanted to do at the time, it's it, it was a very expensive endeavor. We do have a bulkhead in front of South Shore, um, but it doesn't. You know, we have a it's a very large piece of property, and so it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not a complete doesn't protect everything. We don't have one here at Jones Island. Um, and I had said, hey, take a look at it. And then there were all kinds of jokes about how the bulkhead should have like, you know, a tiki bar and other things like that. And people would want to come and hang out by the wastewater treatment plant, you know, stuff like that. Um, but it, it, 
we looked into it and it's actually in the report. Um, if you are interested in reading what they had to say about that, you can contact me and I'd be happy to share the report with you because I mean, it's uh, everything we do is public. So, um, and that part of the project is, is completed, um, but it really was a matter of, it's a very expensive thing to do. And is it, is it really what, would it give us the kind of protection that we need, you know, is it worth the amount of money, essentially? I think if I was going to build Jones Island or South Shore now, I would build it very differently than they are built. But this was built in 1926, so I can't <laughs> I didn't have a lot of say over that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Of um, course. And um, we're going to take a break now. So we'll take five minutes, grab some coffee, stretch your legs, and we'll meet back here um, right at one o'clock for our next presenter. Hope you're feeling a little refreshed. Um, we are going to get back into it with our next presenter. Um, we're stepping away from the coastal zone a little bit, um, which will take us kind of into our larger discussion about resilience and, and climate adaptation next. But um, we're going to hear from Bob McKeel, who's the director of the Monroe County Land and Conservation Department. And he's going to be introducing us to um, the Monroe County Climate Change Task Force and share a little bit how it was formed, funded, and what they've been able to accomplish so far um, as an example of a Wisconsin community kind of thinking ahead and thinking about climate adaptation. So thanks for joining, Bob. Do you, um, you still have your sharing abilities and everything? Yep. Okay, yep. great. Thanks, Lydia. You can uh, see everything okay? Yep, we can see it. And uh, looks like you're not quite in presenter mode yet. There we go. There we are. Okay. All right. Thank you. So thank you, everybody, and afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, like Lydia pointed out, uh, I am not going to be speaking about docks, lakes, or beaches. Um, but I am going to take you um, to a rural county um, which is Monroe County. So I've been the Land Conservation Department Director and working in Monroe County for about 34 years. So I bring a lot of experience to the table when it comes to conservation and dealing with uh, flooding. So the one common trait that we all share is climate change and flooding. The impacts might be different or the outcomes, um, but we're still tackling the same issue. So today, um, again, traveling to Monroe County, if you've ever traveled on Interstate 90 or 94, you've been through Monroe County. Where the interstate split is in Monroe County, uh, you can take 90 through the pretty much central Monroe County and the 94 goes to the, um, the unglaciated portion. So we are in the Driftless area, which brings all kinds of challenges. It's a 580,000 acre county. Um, we have Fort McCoy, which occupies the North Central. You know, like I mentioned before, the Northeast is our cranberry country and the rest of the county is pretty rural as far as agriculture. And as you head north, um, it's pretty wooded. So we're about even as far as agriculture and forest, but we're a rural, rural community. So probably the number one question I get is, how did you ever get um, all your county board um, to approve a resolution that basically states um, we recognize climate change is impacting Monroe County and supports the climate change task force development and uh, the, the objectives that we're working on. And so as if you look at politics, uh, Monroe County is pretty red and, uh, but we'll get to that point of how you can, uh, what do you wanna say, jump at the opportunity to make, make a positive difference. So as you can see, our membership of 16 members cover various professionals within the county, along with elected officials at the county and town level um, and other various uh, partners, whether it's DNR or Fort McCoy. Again, climate change is impacting us just like you guys. Um, the last 34 years, the warmest years, look at 2021, many days above 80 degrees. Temperature increase, increase in evaporation, and it's that major flood events. I always use 2007 as kind of the line in the sand where I've noticed a huge change um, in those storm events. And it's not necessarily the volume, but it's the intensity of that rain. When you get two to six inches an hour, that's something you cannot design for. 
And again, we're seeing that warming occurring during the winter months. We've already had four different rain events this winter, um, and those temperatures are increasing more and more. <clears throat> Symptoms of climate change, we could be talking about the temperature, like I just mentioned, increased precipitation, obviously is gonna affect our well water or groundwater, invasive species, um, and uh, diseases that are affecting plants and animals are in the uptick also. But really it comes down to the flooding that gets people's attention. That 100 year flood event that happens every year. In Mineral County, a unique portion is that we have four water bodies that actually originate in Mineral County. We have the Lemon Weir River, the Baraboo, Kickapoo, La Crosse River, and the Coon Creek that all start in Mineral County. So if we're getting impacted by uh, storm events, our neighboring counties and communities are feeling those effects too. 2018 was a very wet year. Our average annual rainfall is 33 inches. We had uh, collected 60.79 inches in the southern part of the county. Hard to get um, farming, um, harvest, and plantings done when it's that wet. 2019 rolled around. In July, we had three different events. If you look at the lower left corner, that's where they occurred. You can see the lightning bolt shows you where in these different watersheds it's, it's occurring. That intensity is really is what is destroying a lot of our um, infrastructure, agriculture, um, and different practices across the landscape. But really, I circled July 5th, um, 2019, is kind of the born on date of the Monroe County Climate Change Task Force. Uh, it shows a picture on the top of one of my technicians. They're checking a concrete crossing that was built for cattle crossing and machinery. And two days later, um, that's what it looked like after a five inch rain event in 90 minutes. So the farmer called me up to take a look at the situation. I came down there. He was in the barn, yelled at me, uh, let me know what we got to do. I come down here and look at this mess. And this has been accumulating, um, when I say disasters, for, for some time. And I knew at this point that we need to think outside the box and change the way we're doing things and get the heck out of the way. And so basically when I came back, he asked me what are what we're going to do. And that's kind of what I told him. I says, I know what we're not going to do. We're not going to put a concrete crossing or any type of thing in the in the floodplain. Um, but we need to start looking outside the box and addressing the issues and, and just do a better job of implementation, knowing that these floods are occurring um, on an annual basis and at an intensity. If we look at agriculture, uh, the rill and gully erosion is uptick. Uh, saturated uh, soils make uh, harvesting and planting very difficult. Infrastructure, um, our towns and our municipalities are suffering greatly. We've had one town that replaced bridges and culverts three times in one summer. Private property impacts, uh, flooded basements, it doesn't matter if you're living in a valley floor on a ridge top, when you're getting that amount of rain, everybody's affected. The lower left was the, probably the most interesting site I've ever seen in a, in a town. Um, we had a landowner tiling his yard and putting sub pumps out there um, to dry it out just so he could mow it and maintain it. So basically nature is reclaiming the valley floor. As humans, we got pretty comfortable with our farming practices, crowding the stream. Um, same with homes. We like to be next to the water, but obviously in these major flood events, um, taking the backyard away and shearing off the garage. Um, we need to uh, mine our P's and Q's and respect uh, the valley floors and nature. So in 2018, um, we had a major flood event, one of many um, that was concentrated in the Coon Creek watershed. Um, we have 14 large flood control structures in that watershed that affects three different counties. In Mineral County, six of the seven overtopped. These are 40 to 50 foot uh, structures above the valley floor and the water was running over the top. Um, these get uh, 30 to 40 inch uh, corrugated metal pipes as a principal conduit with big emergency spillways as you can see down in the lower right. They all failed in the same principal way. Uh, water was concentrating on the opposite abutment to the emergency spillway. If that didn't happen, the spillway would have failed at some point but you can see how the grass on the backside is all laid down is that because the water was going over the top of these structures. In the end, 
We had three that were damaged that we repaired and the three uh, structures that breached. So this was in the Coon Creek watershed. We also, not too far away in the West Fork of the Kickapoo, lost two structures in that same event. So we lost five structures of the PL-566. There's over 12,000 in this country. Um, this has never happened before. So as you can imagine, we, we got national attention with expertise flying in to take a look at this situation. So if you look at the last three decades um, in Monroe County, 30 years ago, our total damage cost was $33,000. I'd really like to go back to those days. Um, the last 10 has been 33 million. Uh, I just showed you a lot of pictures of infrastructure, large dams, uh, homes, um, businesses, et cetera. It adds up. So that's part of you know the reasons why Monroe County is very interested in tackling um, the situations that are going on. So part of our mission as the Climate Change Task Force was carving out 10 objectives. And they're arranged with sequence based on importance and development time. First and foremost, implementing monitoring devices or weather stations, warning systems in real time by coordinating emergency management and the National Weather Service. Basically, we want to keep people out of harm's way and keep structures out of harm's way. Flooding is a major issue in the Driftless area. Here's an example. So since that original objective list was put together, we've purchased 27 stations, weather stations that are keeping a pulse on the stream flow in these watersheds, along with implementing tipping buckets to measure the precipitation and intensity. So all that information is gathered and uploaded into a cloud and the National Weather Service is our partner in this mission. So they take all that data, um, they located um, all our weather stations on their advanced hydraulic prediction service page, which is available to the public. As you can see, it's color coded with the legend on the right. And at some point when they're all up and running, um, they'll be monitoring, they should be green, no flooding. And as the colors change, people can look and keep an eye on what's going on in their watershed or stream. There's also cameras mounted, so it, it takes a daily photo of what's going on. And that can be changed also. The other um, challenge is I mentioned the structures. Uh, based on preliminary uh, building footprint data and current FEMA mats, we got over 200 structures that are in the floodway and over 500 structures in the flood fringe and much more in the, in the unstudied floodplain. That's a real issue. And that gets highlighted in these big events. So in the declaration of 2018, Monroe County was a disaster county. And uh, we were able to access federal funds to start tackling these structures in the floodway. And so we bought out eight homes. Here's a prime example showing before and after. Um, this uh, residence was flooded out three times the year we're going to take them out, but uh, I think it was half a dozen times in three years that they were flooded. This Marty Severson, who's lower in the watershed, um, shows a picture in the upper left of his place with water um, pretty much destroying all his uh, material stuff in his house. He actually did something that nobody should do is get access to his house during this event, he took this picture inside looking out, and that's where you see the water level up on his windows. So Marty's place was uh, also purchased and bought out. He had five events also in two years. So the environmental impact is returning that green space for, for this flood event. Economic, as you can imagine, every time landowner rebuilds and gets assistance, that costs a lot of money. And the emotional toll for each one of these individuals that lives in these homes is huge. Um, every time it clouds up and looks like a storm event, I guarantee you that these people are not sleep, sleeping knowing that there's another event on the way. With the towns and municipalities, the biggest challenge is the crossings. Um, a lot of these crossings are culverts, some are bridges, but uh, for the most part, not a lot of engineering being done and they're paying the price. I mentioned this earlier, some of these crossings have been destroyed three times in one summer. So in 2021 and 22, um, some of you probably have seen this or done this, is the Great Lakes Survey 123 um, dashboard showing the different crossings that we've assessed and inventoried. 
all in the northeast you can see all that going on in the southern part of the county you see where we're lit up so we just completed this last year and basically what we're doing is um, assessing for flooding conductivity and fish passage within these watersheds and our plan is to work with the towns rank them crossings for funding to get those replaced and uh, train them on design and improvement as far as flood resiliency ultimately we want to become more resilient when it comes to crossings in these assessments and inventory, what we found is about 30% of the structures survey, surveyed are barriers to fish passage. Along with that, lots of erosion. And the one that really jumps out is when you get 40% of the structures are undersized according to the standards, you're gonna have issues when it comes to flooding. So there's a lot of work to be done with the towns on these crossing issues. So like I stressed before, objectives, first and foremost, keep people and structures out of the floodway. And as a conservationist, um, we can do things and we are doing things through mitigating intense rain events on the landscape. We need to buffer and do everything on the landscape before it turns the runoff. And we can do that through soil health practices, cover crops, no-till. And then when that ground is so saturated, we have tools that can address the runoff and that's our grade stage structures. And last but not least, we need to address the cause. We work with the University of Wisconsin, Eric Booth and his grad students, taking a look at infiltration rates with our conservation practices, contour strips, buffer strips, no-till, et cetera. And the, and the other thing is looking at what's going on in the landscape. And what we've noticed is, is quantified is we're almost 30% of our conservation practices our bread and butter practices that keeps water on the landscape are being removed. And that's obviously been changed with uh, the, the culture and landscape of agriculture. So what's that mean to us? We need to do a better job of maintaining what's out there as far as conservation, and then also improve our land use when it comes to um, the soil health principles. The goal is to keep that moisture, that water on the landscape from running off. And when I stated before, we have tools in the toolbox through these small grade safe structures to manage the runoff, not control. And when it hits the valley floor, uh, we also have practices with wetland restoration, which can act as storage for these floodwaters, and then work with our stream restoration projects, which increases the capacity on these streams. An example in one of these sub watersheds where we've implemented soil health measures through um, no-till and contour stripping combined with these dam structures. We put in 41 in this one sub-watershed. Basically what it shows to us that we've knocked off the top of these peaks and these smaller events on this 10-year storm event, we can knock that down to 53% reduction. What is the outcome of that? Our watershed is more resilient. Uh, you can see how we've changed the stream class from a class three to a class one. And we're obviously reducing that sediment. Another project we worked on was the Monroe County Climate Readiness and Rural Economic Opportunity Assessment with Green Fire and about 40 other partners. We wanted to take a granular look at Monroe County when it comes to climate and hydrology, infrastructure, agriculture, and forestry. And the whole concept here is if we can do this in Monroe County, in this municipality, this is a template that can be carried to others. The outcome was 18 strategies followed with 80 action items. And as you look across the table, you can see where they hit as far as the public safety, resiliency, soil and water, and carbon impact. And different uh, strategies include invest in uh, floodplain risk assessments down to maintaining and improving watershed resiliency. The outcomes again is, is creating a climate resilient program and putting demonstration projects on the land and utilizing those as information and education. Uh, one we did this last year was an agroforestry project with the Savannah Institute in Organic Valley. Working with a farmer, implementing um, rotational grazing um, and breaking up his paddocks with fencing and trees. And so, and then quantifying what is the carbon impact. The other thing we did with this is worked with Wisconsin Land and Water uh, to quantify conservation work. So we have a tree sales program. 
So if we sell X amount of trees, what is that equivalent to? So we use the, instead of putting the, the carbon number there, we can relate that to cars. The general public can understand that. Same with the CRP and the CREP program. How many acres are we enrolling in that program and what is the offset when it comes to the cars? And then we also showed that with this farm project. So I'd steer you to, if you go to the YouTube Savannah Institute, you can take a look at that project, um, which is a great, great outcome. This template or this flyer is going out statewide to all our other um, county land conservation departments. Again, a prime example, most of the people look at this as a buffer strip for wildlife. It's a buffer strip for water quality, separation between agriculture and the water quality or the stream. But it is uh, a carbon sink. And so we need to take credit for that. And we're trying to do a better job of that in our conservation world. Anything and everything we do, as you know, uh, costs a lot of money. Um, we started out with the weather um, stations and seeking donations. Um, we had uh, uh, landowners, uh, businesses donate close to $20,000. So we partnered those donations with Fisher and Farmers, Hazard Mitigation Grant, um, buyouts or planning, um, ARPA funds, the DNR Municipal Flood Control Grant, Health Capacity Grant, and the BRIC Grant for a grand total of $1.7 million. So far, we've implemented over the last few years. Again, that information and education, we're doing all these projects. Uh, we need to build momentum. Because Monroe County is doing it, we have a lot of our surrounding counties, um, different uh, agencies, uh, different folks interested in wanting to make change. As you can see, we've, we've been on public radio. Um, we've been on the news. We've hosted uh, Lieutenant Governor um, and various uh, political reps. And we're just trying to get things done, trying to get the momentum going in Western Wisconsin. So we host a bunch of listening sessions, watershed meetings. We have monthly climate change task force meetings and presentations just like I'm doing today. Other resources I'd point you to, if you wanna learn what Monroe County is up to, you can go to our website and we have a climate change task force uh, logo you can click on. It takes you to a page with all kinds of resources and presentations that you would have access to. And the other one would be the Wisconsin Land and Water uh, page. Um, they're one of our partners. Um, so we're creating a climate hub of resource information that counties and other uh, folks across the state can access and get information on. With that, I covered a lot of information and stuff in a short period of time. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Bob. Um, a lot of great information. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat, raise your hand, come off mute. We've got a comment with uh, outstanding and a couple of exclamation points in the chat for you. <laughs> Thank you. I realize I'm the curveball in your presentations today. <laughs> you are the curveball. We do have a question. Um, from someone in the chat was, uh, how did you convince people that climate change was real? How, how did you do that outreach? So um, that's that's a question in about every presentation I ever get. Um, so I don't dwell on the wordage climate change. I'm giving a presentation, I mentioned climate change, but I'm talking about the symptoms and how it affects each and every one of us. And so that's where your focus needs to be. Some people wanna get hung up on those words, but I don't give them time. Let's move on to the issues and how are we gonna solve it? Great, thank you. And you have a lot of visuals that I think help with that as well, just from the presentation today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions for Bob? No, no questions. Oh. <laughs> From me, I just wanted to say it was um, like uh, Marjorie in the comments, really, really great work and um, loved all the visuals. And I think the way you um, sort of worked through everything is was really great to, to hear about. So thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, we have another comment in the chat echoing that as well. I am curious um, where your partnership with the um, Weather Service came into play. How did that come about? So researching, we wanted to do the, the weather stations. And obviously, um, my best hire was a land use planner. So she's the, the person that seeks out the grants and uh, keeps her eye open on potential funding, but also did the researching for the weather stations. And so looking all over the country, uh, we ended up uh, hosting the Iowa Flood Center uh, for a meeting. And anybody who's get a chance, uh, Google that sometime. They have weather stations across the state. Um, and they've spent a boatload of money on it. But part of that is bringing the weather, um, our local weather um, community out of La Crosse and providing insight and information and, and having that dialogue and meeting with these issues. And they said, basically, if you can provide us um, with technology out there and data that we can utilize, we will for sure harvest that and get that back out to the public. And so that communication also helps with our warning system with emergency management and dispatch and letting our landowners and citizens of the county know what's going on as far as weather goes. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all our speakers. Um, we, uh, there might be a, another comment in the chat for you, Bob, if you wanna take a look, but um, we're gonna move on to our next activity. So um, I'm just going to share my screen here, um, but we're going to have the chance to kind of talk with each other about um, what we heard today from our presenters and debrief a little bit more about it. Um, so I'm just going to take a couple minutes to walk through what we're going to do, and then we'll have time um, to meet in groups. Um, so the way it's going to work is um, we are going to have a few minutes to reflect on some prompts. Uh, we have three prompts for you. And then when we break out into our uh, into our rooms, we'll have the chance to talk about those three prompts with our um, with our rooms. And there's going to be um, a jam a jam board, a Google jam board, if you've ever used one of those before, where we can co collectively um, kind of put in what we've talked about in that time. Um, and so we'll have, uh, I have five minutes for reflection here. We'll probably just uh, take it down to uh, a couple minutes. Um, but each breakout room will have a facilitator so they can help record or, sh or share um, what the group discusses. If you guys wanna get into the Jamboard and type out your own thoughts, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, but we'll have facilitators and then, um, after we finish our, with our breakout rooms, we'll just have a, a minute to share kind of what each group talked about. And um, I'll make sure to summarize that when we share the recording of this presentation so that everyone can um, see what, what each group was talking about. Um, so with that in mind, um, we are going to kind of take what we heard from our on the ground projects that our presenters talked about and think a little bit um, about our own experience with resilience and climate adaptation. So our three prompts for um, today are, what is your number one resiliency or adaptation issue? What is your current plan to deal with that issue? And then thinking about this network a little bit more, um, is uh, what can Calm do to help you move forward? Or uh, I would even challenge you to think about what you can do uh, for the network as well. Um, and so I am gonna let you guys reflect on these questions for a minute. I will share a, um, a link in the chat to a poll everywhere. And this way we can kind of see what people are thinking of for the first question. So as you're reflecting about um, these prompts, um, feel free to add what your number one resiliency or adaptation issue is. And we're gonna create a word cloud um, so that everyone can kind of get an idea. Um, so I will share that in just a second and um, feel free to um, take a minute to reflect. All right, so this is the link to the poll everywhere. Um, I'll share my screen and um, as you're thinking about your number one resilience or adaptation issue, feel free to uh, plug it in here.
All right, we're seeing some answers come in. Intense flooding, uh, quick rainfall. And I'll download these answers and, and, uh, and make sure this is something that you guys can see outside of it, but bluff erosion, flooding, updated design. Precipitation, changing lake levels. Okay. Great. Thank you so much for uh, sharing. And um, I am going to stop the share. And then I'm going to have Hannah break us out into our breakout room. So just give us a minute while we get that uh, set up, and you'll see a prompt on your screen um, to go into your next breakout room. So you can just click join. It's gonna give folks a minute to come back to the main room. Um, but once everyone gets back, we'll just have a, about a minute from each group to share what they talked about. Either the facilitator can do it or someone who is really gung-ho about the discussion and uh, wants to share. Um, but we'll take just a minute for each of the four breakout rooms, and then we'll do a little wrap up before we go. All right. Looks like we have most people back. Um, well, Jim, do you want to start off the sharing with your notes? Sure. Thank you. So, so we had a we had a wonderful group. Um, we uh, covered a lot of territory, and um, uh, I think our biggest discussion was on uh, intense rainfall. Uh, that that seemed to be number one. Number two was a little bit of uh, lake levels and and uh, erosion along that. Um, our um, what are what are what are people doing? Um, it, it sounds like there's some some pretty good uh, uh, networks being formed. Uh, Kenosha on the Fox River was one of them. We we of course had Monroe County, which which was wonderful, and um, uh, uh, Bob was telling us about uh, uh, you know the IntelliSense uh, sensors that that they're using uh, to to forecast and uh, keep track of things. Uh, let's see. Um, we had for our um, uh, for our things to for calm to do in the future. Uh, the big the big answer was more discussions like this, and and maybe with an even bigger network because of the uh, uh, the range of of uh, contributions that that people were were talking about. We we had a lot of discussions about you know what are what are people using for their um, uh, hundred year you know design uh, event, and then you know how much more are they adding to that? So people were very interested in in those technical sorts of things. So that's that's us. Group four. Well, thanks group four. That sounds like a, a full discussion. It was great. <laughs> awesome, I'm glad to hear it. Um, Kate, can I put you on the spot to share about your group briefly? Sure, yeah, we. I think it's gonna sound quite a bit like what Jim shared, but we uh, went through the questions and one of the things that came out in the number one resiliency or adaptation issue, it wasn't, everybody felt like they had different issues maybe, but it, a lot of what people talked around was this idea of buy-in from locals and making sure people understand the importance of um, mapping and modeling and background information that goes into risk. So not just flooding and coastal flooding and erosion, but also um, making sure that people understand the issues out there and how that really plays into coming up with good solutions. Um, and then Talking about current plan, there's some discussion about whether we have current plans and the different organizations we're all a part of, but one thing that came up was looking for ways to communicate with stakeholders and communities and how today's presentation from Monroe County kind of helped to crystallize that. 
Um, and then some discussions about how the informal work groups that we're all a part of like this one can play into that and help us come up with ways to approach um, dealing with these issues. Uh, and then we talk a bit about um, the funding that's out there and accessing it and making sure that we can find ways to have um, creative non-cash contributions and other opportunities for match coming up with those kind of solutions. And then we spent a little time talking about what Calm can do and yes, it hosts more meetings like this and keep this up um, and having people present on their projects and on their successes, how that really can help um, others to learn from each other. Great, thank you. Another great discussion. Okay, um, Emily, do you mind sharing next? Yeah, so similar to Kate, we talked about how to get that community buy-in, how to get the community interested in doing this planning and this work before the disaster happened, but also how do you get the whole community, like the community-wide to work together and not just have a, a siloed uh, plan siloed work that's not involving everyone that's within the community, everyone who's at important stakeholders. We also talked about flood mitigation as a as an important issue, and also trying to find and get the data, rainfall data, be able to help you to design the infrastructure that you need. Since things are changing, where do we find that data, and how what's the best use of it? And so for the second one is what is the current plans that we're dealing with with these issues. First off, trying to get that rainfall data, Wiki has been really helpful. The Wiki, the Wisconsin issue of the climate change impacts that report, being able to some subgroups looking at the data that they provide to help them infer what to do with those designing projects. Also talking about, we had a planner in our group talking about how within your hazard mitigation plans, comprehensive plans, incorporating that climate change impacts in them or also the coastal hazard impacts. Um, then with getting that buy-in and also educating the community, making sure that we're providing these examples uh, through pictures, through case studies of like getting the communities and people to understand what is occurring and being able to know that. Um, another part is uh, for flooding, there's this webpage that we can share. It's called reducefloodrisk.com.org, which is uh, the webpage is helps helps people be empowered to learn about the strategies beforehand before working with a consultant too. And then lastly, similar to everyone else said, how can Calm help going forward? A big thing, events like this, being able to hear from other, other municipalities and communities of what the work they have been doing. Um, also keeping up this type of community of practice with, with Calm, working with having the communities be able to come together and talk with each other, but then also having newsletters or emails that if there's new information that's coming out, new data being able to share with everyone so that people know about it. So that is it from our group. Great, thank you so much, Emily. And then Todd, anything else to add from your group? Yeah, we had a great discussion. Um, there's definitely some, I think, overlap and, and um, uh, synergy with the other group's discussion as well too, but we did have a good robust discussion. Um, for the first question, number one, resilience or adaptation issue, impacts of flooding and bluff erosion. Uh, we did talk about as well um, the need for additional data and not only additional data, but data analysis for existing data in hand um, in, in the way to actually help make an informed decision. We talked about increased public education to support the work um, by our local and state stakeholders, um, economic impact as well, too, and being able to translate that to the public. Uh, fluctuating water levels, uh, finding ways for citizens to get together to talk about individual options, um, funding to implement resiliency projects, as well as readily available tools for citizens to enact activities on their own properties. Um, and then what is your current plan to deal with your issue? Uh, we did, again, kind of talk about digital data collection analysis, making data existing, uh, making existing data publicly available, translating the data for public uses and support, integration with other data sources, so state, federal, et cetera, and then uh, actually engaging in more uh, uh, synergy in that data analysis as well, too. Um, opportunities for education, and this, some of these are specific to Ozaki County, but along Lake Michigan, um, Love Your Great Lakes Day, Treasures of Oz, and other uh, NGO events as well, too. Um, and then prioritization of needs and projects uh, assist with uh, that will also assist with buy-in from stakeholders. 
And we didn't spend as much time on what Calm can do, but we did, you know, we did talk about the value of Calm, the need for more continued Calm events, um, being a part of the community of practice, uh, continue to provide wonderful opportunities like what we have here today, um, finding ways to get this information on public TV as well as other public news sources. Um, and then also I think the benefit that Calm provides when it comes to collaboration, finding ways to collaborate on projects uh, finding common funding sources and items like that. Great. Well, that's all an excellent lead into um, our wrap up question here. I'm going to throw another poll everywhere at you in the chat. Um, so for those of you who are still on, um, if you want to open that up, I would just want to rank uh, or get an idea of how people are feeling for our spring meeting. Um, so just rank your preference for if you're looking to do an in-person meeting and and um, doing some more um, maybe workshops or trainings or something like that and um, or discussions or if you prefer to keep the format virtual for our spring meeting and that'll help me with um, planning over the next couple months. Um, so while we're while I'm wrapping up, feel free to just um, respond to that poll. Um, oh, it says it's unavailable. Oh boy. Yeah, I'm having trouble too. Okay, let me see about that. I'm gonna reactivate it here. We could also just put it in the chat. Yeah, why don't you guys just throw it in the chat? I want to be mindful of everyone with everyone's time. So just throw it in the chat. Um, and I just want to say thank you to our speakers. Um, it was great to hear from you all this afternoon. Um, and we're going to have a recording of the meeting posted on the Wisconsin Coastal Resilience website, along with the word cloud and the summary of our um, discussions in the breakout rooms. So take a look um, for that. I'll send probably in the next week, uh, by the end of the next week, um, I'll be sending out um, that summary. And, you know, just a reminder that we have our monthly coastal resilience newsletter. And if um, we have that collaboration classified section, if there's any updates that you want to share with the um, network, if you want to get any input or lessons learned from folks, um, just reach out to me or um, go to the contact us page on the website and uh, I can help you get that onto the newsletter. So thank you for all your participation, your discussion. Thanks to our speakers. And um, it was great to see you all and have a good rest of your Thursday, I believe it is.